friends. I always have to exit out of Canva. Canva and I don't get along. Every single month I make the slideshow. This month I forgot to write with Robin Melendez. And then I forgot to put it on a timer to where it does all of that. So Robin has just dropped in the chat. If you want to join her for a little activity today, um, definitely feel free to do that. And um, this is a webinar for a National Ladies Homestead Gathering. And I'm so glad you guys are here. Yes, I am on just a few minutes early. If you have never been to one of our gatherings, don't worry. I'm not starting without everyone. Um, every month I come on just a few minutes early and I do our VIP drawing for $5 off an item in our National Ladies Homestead Gathering shop. So for all of the VIP members that attended last month, Number one, our oh, the dogs are upset. Number one, our um, YouTube videos live for last month. We did herbal teas with Michelle, and she did a phenomenal job. So they're going to be upset for a moment. There's someone who's coming. Oh well, I'm going to go ahead and do our drawing. So let's hop on to that because that's more exciting. Let's go here and here, and we'll share our screen. The curse of it's the curse of letting your livestock guardian dogs inside. All right, there we go. Okay, full screen it. All right, let's see which one of the friends. Come on, spin. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, oh! I always know when it comes up. Carla, congratulations! <laughs> All right, if I don't take a picture of it, I don't remember. And then that doesn't help any of us. That doesn't help us. Okay, so we're getting super close to starting. So I am so excited that you guys are here, for all of you early birds. It's always fun when we have a lot of people hop in and they do things quickly um, and get it, get everyone sorted out really fast. So yay. Okay, so like I've said, if you're here already, then um, Robin's dropped in the chat where you can join. Um, we're going to have, she's going to have some prizes. So check that out. I've never used it. So I'm kind of excited. Robin is a pro at doing all of our um, things. So, oh, my husband just got home. So yay. Okay. Um, we are getting ready to start this. We'll give everyone like another minute to join. Um, and then I'll explain tonight's settings. But if you have never been here before, make sure you drop in the chat where you're from. Um, let's see. Megan's asking for a link. Let's see. Car Robin's taking care of it. Awesome. We're going to rock and roll tonight. I'm really excited to talk about fodder. I genuinely thought I had an idea because we've grown fodder for our chickens. And then Robin sent the uh, presentation she's talking about. I was like, wow, I know nothing. This is going to be awesome. So I'm really excited for tonight. Um, and I'm glad that you guys are here. Um, early, and we'll get going here in just a minute. Um, this is the National Ladies Homestead Gathering. Gathering, it's our virtual gathering we do at the first Wednesday of every month. All of our previous gatherings are posted on our YouTube page. So if you're a VIP member, you have early access to it. And I'll explain why that might be a little different this month, but we'll see. Um, and then at the first Wednesday of every month, last month's gathering is posted on our YouTube page. So yay, that's awesome. Welcome, Sheila. Yay, it's seven o'clock, so we're gonna get going. I know we'll get some more people, but if you've never been here before, uh, make sure you drop in the chat where you are and I will kind of say what's going on. So my name is Julie Bowen. I'm the media director for National Ladies Homestead Gathering. If you are just now getting on, I'm so excited for you guys to be here. Um, we are going to rock and roll tonight. I know it's going to be a ton of fun. I'm excited about tonight. It's going to be great. If you have never been to one of our gatherings before, this is a webinar format. So the only thing I'm seeing right now is my happy face talking to my happy face. <laughs> I can't see any of you all. So you and you guys can't see each other. So it's different if you've ever been in a Zoom meeting or done something like that. This is entirely different. A webinar is really just where we are talking to you and you can drop in the chat. You can use the Q&A. I know Robin will explain when she gets on here what she's doing tonight um, with her Q&A stuff because it'll be kind of fun. So 
just drop in the chat where you're from. It's always fun for me to see where we get together because I love our in-person meetings. Like if you're part of a local chapter, I'm so happy for you. It's fun to connect that way. But the virtual gatherings are great for all of us that want to come together. Maybe we don't have a local chapter nearby and this is when we get together. And I love that. So I really hope that all of you all are joining in from everywhere else. Send the link to someone else that can join. We'll have a good time. I've mentioned it already, um, but I did it kind of at like that, bouncing back and forth between when I jump on early and now. If you have not checked out our YouTube channel, make sure you check it out, not just because I'm one of those people that's like, hit the subscribe button, because I feel like that's on every YouTube video, but all of our previous gatherings are on there for like the last two years. So there's lots of things on there. There's lots of information. So make sure you check that out. Um, if you're just now jumping on, make sure you check out the, um, or drop in the chat where you're from. Let's see. There we go. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Just drop in the chat where you're from. We've got lots of people. We've got Idaho, Georgia, Missouri. Oh, yay. Steph, I'm not far from, I think Green County is not far from me. We're like three hours. Well, we're two hours from the border. So I don't think you guys are that fun. Ooh, Kansas, Ohio. We've got people from everywhere. New York, Tennessee. Yay. I love having everyone come from everywhere. It makes me happy. So like I've said already, but I'm going to keep repeating myself. We are doing a webinar tonight. So what's going to happen is I'm going to sit here and talk. You're going to see my pretty face. And then here in a little bit, I'll bring up another pretty face. And then I'll bring up Robin's pretty face. And Robin will talk to you a lot longer than I will. But you get to look at a bunch of pretty faces, but you can't see each other and we can't see you. So we are going to get, Robin is going to talk to us tonight about the basics of fodder, which is really for me, like awesomely insightful. I think she's done a really good job and I'm excited um, that she'll be sharing her knowledge with all of us. So we're going to give it a few more minutes. And while we're waiting for a few more people to join us, I'm going to throw up a poll. And I like throwing up polls every now and then when I remember to do them. Y'all would never know that I have made a poll. Like back in January, when the executive staff and I got together, I made polls for every single gathering, minus December. I did January through November. I made polls for every single gathering. Do you know how many I've launched? Like three, because I forget them. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this question. You've got a few minutes to answer it. It'll give us something fun while we get some more people in here. But here is our question for tonight so and I did just give you single choice so that's all you get single choice question no or at least yeah so it'll give us a second to kind of like pop up and populate and then I'll give you guys the answer so you will also get to see me normally I would bring Cindy Ball our founder the amazing Cindy and um, I would bring her on but she's had a brand new grandbaby edition uh, so I told her, take the night off, get some baby snuggles. That's way more, not that you all aren't awesome, but that's such a short amount of time. So Christine says she doesn't have any animals, just a dog. Well, maybe you grow your dog's food, Christine. Actually, I know she doesn't because I love her and we we talk not on a regular basis, but I know enough that she's not doing that, but still, see, none of these you're putting, no livestock here, just a kitty and a dog. Yep. You. <laughs> See, you can grow your dog. We'll see what what we come up with for growing our dog's food. Okay, questions are starting to wind down. So I'm going to go in poll. Let's share results. I think that most of us do a mix of store-bought and free-ranging weirdness. And I hope you appreciate my phrasing on that. Because if you have chickens, they eat some weird stuff. Way weird stuff. And that really goes for all types of poultry. Um. They are just weird, weird animals. So I will stop sharing that and exit out of it. Let's see. There's all kinds of stuff that we're going to be talking about doing tonight. We have lots of things coming up, but I know you are not here to um, see me. So I will say National Ladies Homestead Gathering is super special to me. And you guys are probably here. Most of you are probably here because it's special as well. But if you've never heard of us, um, National Ladies Homestead Gathering, our purpose is to empower women through homesteading. And we do that by sharing our knowledge, building community, and growing friendships. So all of that is our sole purpose and mission behind what we do. 
And I'm lucky enough to be on the executive staff and to participate in these gatherings with you all. But we believe that sharing knowledge and building and growing friendships is the best way to do that. Because homesteading is not limited to vast number of acres or it's not, you don't have to have animals. I mean, there's people in here that just have cats and dogs and that's fine. It's anything you want to do at home, wherever you call home, that's what we're here for. That's how we do it. And our network is nationwide. Like we are across America. We have urban, suburban. What are the other ones? Uh, rural city. Oh, I guess that's urban. You know what I mean? So we come together, we support each other, we learn from one another. And Cindy started that back in 2011, and it just keeps growing. So I hope you all will join us. Um, we have a private online, oh, yeah, see, uh, we have a private online community where you guys can check us out. We've got over 30 chapters in I think we're up to 13 states, but if one of the executive staff wants to correct me on that, I'm totally fine with it. So we love what we do and we can't do it without you all. So if there's something in your area that you're like, hey, I want to be a part of that, or there's not something and you still want to be a part of it, let us know. We're here to help. We can't do this without each other. That's my opinion. We can't do it without each other. Community is so important. Um, so let's build those communities by sharing your knowledge and growing our friendships. One of the friendships that I really like to grow is with our amazing membership director, the amazing June. June does all kinds of stuff. She is super dedicated and her hard work behind the scenes is like mm, on point. Girlfriend has got the vibrant community spirit and I love it. So June, you know, I appreciate your effort and making sure that our members experience, what is it like, and then what would be a cliche say, enriching it and filling happiness in their membership uh, commitment. There we go. I don't know. Just throwing words out now. So June, are you somewhere around here? And would you like to share all of the fun things that you I am do? here. And what yeah. My it's video fun. though, it's, it says the host has disabled my video. I do do that a lot. I just really like to only <laughs> see my own face. So it's really just a selfish thing. I just like to see myself talk. Let's try now. Did it work now? Winning! Yes. <laughs> Some days we can do it right. June, what are our ladies? Hey there, friend. Oh, Julie, it's always so good to see you. I look forward to these monthly national virtual gatherings. It's fun to kind of get together with people, with ladies from all around the country. And as you can see, all those locations popped up in our chat. We're all over the place. And it's so good to have this community. Speaking of community, um, we have an online private online community in Mighty Networks. You want to make sure if you're not a part of that, um, make sure that you join us because there we share all of our experiences, successes, failures, wins, um, just so much good community happening there and building those friendships, sharing that knowledge. Um, so I want to invite you first and foremost to be part of that online community. And one of the things we do in the community is uh, we share Atta Girls. And that is each month I do a post prior to this monthly gathering asking for people to share what they did this past month. Big, small, good or bad, share what you accomplished. And it is so inspiring to see all of the things you ladies have been up to. So I'm going to take a few minutes to read some of these. But again, pop over there, check it out. Often there's a really cool photo, sometimes a recipe, other tidbit, tidbits added in. Um, you can learn so much from just the Atta Girl posts. So Victoria shared, we picked green beans for the very first time when a neighbor offered to let us come pick two rows in his garden. We picked 13 gallons. I've only been canning for a couple of months, but we put up 33 quarts. What a blessing. Atta Girl Victoria. Melody shared, we did some big cleanups, lean-tos, sheds, etc. We started construction. 
on earthen house. It's a big job we've been putting off. We put 25 cups of bagged and chopped squash and zucchini and almost 20 ears of corn in the freezer camp. Harvested and put up a full quart of nettle seeds. Lost count of how many jars of fermented pickles. Learning how to make kombucha and have made a few good batches so far. We finished tearing down a shed and I had hubby make us a bar on the front porch from the wood flooring, a great place to sit. Okay, there's a ton more, she said, but she'll stop now. Add a girl, Melody. Oh, we've all been so busy. Uh, and like I said, I'm so inspired. And often I look at the responses on this post and think, my goodness, you all make me look like <laughs> I'm just sitting around on my porch. Um, which is also good to enjoy this time of year. Jennifer said she learned to can this summer. So now she has canned green beans, pork, chicken, spaghetti sauce, dill pickles, and tomatoes. Add a girl, Jennifer. Lorinda sold three of her purebred mini jerseys and had heifer sexed AI straws made from her bull. NW Vanguard. It's been a huge month for her and her herd of little, a little herd of minis. She has a beautiful picture of one of her mini jerseys there. At a girl. Um, and then Karen shared she processed delicata squash, pumpkins, and corn. At a girl. And then Melody um, shared about her delicata just starting fruiting a couple of weeks, weeks ago. That's one thing that's neat is you get to hear where people in different parts of the country, where they're at with things. Aurelia said this is the first year that she has canned more produce. Then she has had to feed her chickens from spoilage. Green beans, peaches, salsa, tomato sauce, small batch canning has really helped with this. Had a girl, Aurelia. Donna harvested tomatoes from the garden, canned tomato sauce and salsa, entered the county fair, salsa received a red ribbon, hand embroidered card received a blue ribbon, helped set up at the LHG booth at the local fair and then volunteered um, to share that, made a German chocolate cake from scratch for a friend's birthday and helped with food distribution with the church. Add a girl, Donna. Donna, like I said, that just makes me feel tired out and inspired yeah. reading all of these things. I'm so amazed. So make sure you're part of our private online community and you don't miss this opportunity to share and learn with each other. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, June. I cannot believe, like June said, that made me tired just listening to it. That's a lot. You guys are so awesome. And get over there and join so that we can hear what you guys are up to. It's always fun. I like seeing what you guys are up to because it gives me some motivation. So check out that online community. It's lots of fun. Uh, we have a great time over there. There's always something interesting going on. And um, also on our executive staff is Jill Wolf. And Jill is our marketing director. She does such a great job. Um, with our National Ladies Homestead Gathering shop. Every month there is something new and cute in there. So go and check that out. It's a fun place. We do all, she designs something different for every month. So you never know what's going on. I really like it. And you can wear anything you buy there to our next National Gathering. Why don't you guys head on up to Idaho? It's um, October 6th and 7th. And it is two days of amazing speakers. And I love the way they've designed it. Like you don't have to, if you want to go to someone in the morning, you're not going to miss this other person that's also talking in the morning. They, you have the opportunity to hear everyone. Miranda has done such a great job. Her and her team have done a phenomenal job organizing that event. So that is going to be our national gathering in Wallace, Idaho. That's October 6th and 7th. Make sure you check that out because it's going to have some really great demonstrations and booths. And there's all kinds of things that you guys will uncover up there. I really, really would like to go. So make sure you check that out. It's um, it's going to be a ton of fun. So the last thing I have to tell you all, and I know that you're sick of seeing my face, so I promise I will get out of here in just a second. But we have a new website coming. 
So there's always some uh, something going on, right? Something somewhere. We're always doing something on different corners. So I, I'm not going to tell you who's designing the uh, website because she doesn't want to shout out, but she's also on the executive staff. And she, there's a group of them that have been working non stop to get the website going. So if you are a VIP member and you're like, hey, Julie, you slacker, this uh, last month's video wasn't on the website and the month before that wasn't on the website. It's not me, I promise. Website drama, it just happens, right? Like sometimes things go awry in the world of technology. So our new website will be live this month. I don't have a date for you yet, but keep on the lookout. I promise it'll be here. This gathering will be on there and I'm going to try something tricky for this one. We'll see if it works, but I promise, I promise, I promise. I haven't forgotten you all. All the previous ones are on the YouTube now and I will figure out a way to share this with you. <sighs> I've talked a lot. I know I've talked a lot. You're sick of seeing this, right? What's this thing? Hmm. My dance moves are on point, y'all, on point. But instead of you seeing my face, why don't I bring on the amazing Robin? She's going to give you all of her insights for tonight. Robin, I know you know what you're doing with this Zoom hoopla that I put on here. So I'll let you share what they need to join, how they need to join, who you are, because you're awesome like that. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Robin. Yeah, absolutely. Um if you guys can not see me or hear me at any point, just let me know. Uh, I was uh, venting to Julie before we got started that my husband spent about six hours working on my computers yesterday to try to get some things working and uh, it didn't go so well. So uh, <laughs> we're, hopefully you can see and hear me okay. Um, if not, just let me know. I'm going to try to pull up chat and all that fun stuff as well. Um, so before we officially get started here, um, I put in the chat a couple of times in Zoom that uh, we're going to be doing kind of a fun game today and, uh, you know, just some more participation throughout. Uh, if you're watching this after the recording, the, it'll be shut down, so you can't participate. But if you're here with us live, uh, you can join us at, I'm assuming it's called vbox.app. Um, you can scan the QR code at the bottom, and then the ID is right at the top. If you scan the QR code on your phone, uh, you don't have to worry about typing the ID in. Um, it will ask you for your name, and that's because the person or people with the highest scores will be put in a drawing at the end to win some fodder crop seeds. And we'll talk about what specific seeds later on. So if you're interested, it's not mandatory guys, but if you're interested at all in maybe winning some seeds or just having doing something fun together, feel free to do so. Um, you can join through your mobile device, uh, iPad, anything with internet connection will be completely fine. And this information will be up during the whole um, presentation. So if you end up dropping or something happens, feel free to just, uh, it'll be up here the whole time. You can't miss it. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, agenda for tonight. So I'm going to introduce myself briefly. We're going to quickly talk about what fodder crops are, but my main focus and what I hope that you'll get out of this is taking some, uh, getting some ideas of fodder crops that you can grow. Um, you know, I want you to know what a fodder crop is, but I, what I really want is for you to walk away saying, I can do that. And that sounds kind of fun. So that's that's kind of my goal here. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end for some questions and answers. You may notice through VVOX that you could, there's also a Q&A section. Feel free to drop stuff there. I'll check it periodically. You can do through the chat. I've got that up. You could do through the Q&A, uh, both of those in Zoom, whatever method you'd like. And I'll kind of stop periodically to check those methods to see if we've got any questions. Um, the other thing I will mention, uh, it is I'm on the East Coast. And so it's like 820. So that's why my lighting is really weird and very dark and uh, and all that. So bear, bear with me. And plus, I like to go to bed at like nine. So if I seem kind of scatterbrained or anything like that, uh, give me some grace if you don't mind. Okay. So introduction, a little bit about me. So that's a picture of me back in, I don't know, maybe December or January uh, with my our newest addition to the flock, Audrey. She's a white crested Polish 
uh, chicken. She is very strange and awkward. So I enjoy her the most. Uh, so I live in Hawkins County, Tennessee. That's uh, in zone seven. Uh, although there's debate about if we're 7A or 6B or all of that. I call it zone seven and call it a day. Um, that's on the eastern side of Tennessee uh, there in the mountains. Uh, we have uh, what I was surprised when I moved here. We have really wide swings between highs and lows. So it's, you know, we might have a 30 degree swing um, on highs and lows even now. Uh, so it's it's very, very strange weather pattern. I had uh, I moved here from eastern North Carolina where things were like at this time of year, like 90 degrees, no matter what time of day or night it was. So uh, so anyway, it's been really kind of refreshing, honestly, <laughs> to move out here where I at least get to feel a little bit of relief from the heat. Um, I've been involved with NLHC since April of 2022 and became the VP of my local chapter in February of 2023. Um, I can't emphasize enough about how great this organization is, whether you're just involved at a national level or locally. Um, just a quick example. Well, today I somehow cut myself. I'm clumsy, so it happens. And because of the things I learned here, I used a homemade antibiotic salve and literally watched the cut heal itself. And I mean, you, you wouldn't be able to see it on my finger within moments. Um, and so the 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 things that you learn from this group, the relationships you get, um, you just can't find them anywhere else. Uh, if you're not involved with the local chapter, or if this is your first time, you know, kind of getting an introduction to us, I encourage you to go look on our website. I'm sure Christine can drop that in there and show the list of all our chapters so that you can um, take a take a look and see if there's something in your area where you could connect with people face to face. There's nothing like it. Um, if you don't have one in your area, I encourage you to reach out and to um, to start your own chapter. You can email chapter development at nlhg.org and start the ball rolling. It only takes one person to get things moving. So um, start that discussion and start that community yourself. Um, okay, enough of the uh, infomercial on NLHG. Uh, so I have goats. Um, they are Nigerian and La Mancha mix goats. Um, honeybees and chickens. So my that kind of gives you a perspective of where I'm coming out with fodder. Um, I'll also say uh, it is definitely a myth that goats eat anything. <laughs> Anybody else have goats? Um, my goats are way pickier than I thought they would be. Um, I really struggled last year when we got them of like, uh, they won't eat anything except for like poison ivy, which is cool. And the grain I feed them, they would not eat any kind of things I was trying to feed them. I've learned a lot since then, but yeah, goats are way pickier. So I come from a perspective of chickens that eat everything and anything, literally um, bees that will pollinate everything so things grow better and then goats that won't eat anything. So that's where my perspective comes from. Um, I work full time and I homestead as much as I can. So I homestead before work, at lunch and after work and then on the weekends. So uh, for those of you guys who, um, who also work. I hope that you can appreciate the caveat of, I don't have time to mess with plants that need a lot of maintenance. If, it, if it's a fussy plant that I have to babysit, I cannot deal with that. So um, it's got to be any kind of plant. And the plants that I'm going to talk to you about today are going to be things that basically plant it and forget that it's there until it's time to harvest. If it's not like that, if it doesn't survive on its own in my garden, it's going to die because I've got way too much going on. Um, <clears throat> and I've been into father cops for about a year now, so I will not ever claim that I'm an expert really on anything. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to share with you what I know just to try to get you guys thinking and doing research. There's so many resources out there. Um, I'd encourage you to look up Sean and Beth Doherty if you have not already. They were, I would consider experts on fodder crops. I had the honor of hearing them speak a couple of times. Um, at the Homesteaders, Homesteaders of America conference last year. Um, they're excellent and uh, they speak at your level too, which is really appreciated for someone like me. All right. So <clears throat> for those of you that are on VBOX, uh, you should now see on your phone or on your computer, wherever you are, just a little um, survey. This doesn't count for any points, but just wanted to get a feel for, um, you know, what people, you know, where you are right now. So again, that that um, the link is up top with the ID. You can also scan the QR code, whatever you need to do to be able to get you there. 
and feel free to come in or out at any point, no problem. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. We can look at our uh, results. And here they come. Okay, so people know a little bit. Uh, we don't have any experts in the room, which is fine. I uh, would have loved to have called on an expert. Um, heard the words, words before, some people have not at all heard of what fodder crops are. Cool, I was in that spot just a year ago, didn't really know what that meant, uh, no clue. So um, no problem, so that's that's awesome. Um, I, I would also encourage folks, use the chat. If, you, if I go through these five, I'm just picking five of my favorite fodder crops. If you use fodder crops and you're aware of other things that are really excellent, feel free to drop them in the chat. Give other people ideas too, because I'm always looking for cool stuff as long as it's low maintenance that I can plant and reduce uh, any kind of uh, extra maintenance or craziness on the farm. All right, next question. This one counts for points. Let's see what you know before we get started. What is a fodder crop? So is it a crop grown specifically to feed livestock? Is it a crop designed by Ted Fodder to enhance your soil quality? A crop grown specifically for human consumption or a crop grown on a ship, hence cannon fodder? Give you just a few moments to be able to attempt that question. Three, two, one, and here we go. What do we got? Excellent. So yes, um, absolutely right. So it is a crop grown specifically to feed livestock. Um, and that's what that's what I say on the next slide. Um, however, the third one, um, which I'm glad none of, none of you guys picked that because that was kind of a little tricky. You can grow fodder crops that you also eat. And that's the other advantage of fodder crops. And what we do there is, you know, you may grow something specifically uh, for um, your animals, but it also may be nutritious and delicious for you and your family as well. Um, Natasha, that would be Beth and Sean Doherty. They are awesome. Awesome, awesome. They are the authors of The Independent Farmstead, I believe is their book. Don't hold me to that, but it's that book by itself is worth its weight in gold. All right. So next question. It's a little tricky. Are forage crops and fodder crops the same thing? Forage crops and fodder crops, the same thing. And three, two, one. No, that is absolutely right. So um, thank you, June. Yes, Sean and Beth. Um, <clears throat> so, Yes, they. you will often hear people use these terms interchangeably, where they'll say forage slash fodder crops. Now, here's here's the difference, and I want to make sure if you're going to do your own research, look at books, go on Google, things like that. I want to make sure your lingo's right, so when you're doing your research, you know the exact thing to look for. So forage crops are things that you plant so that, that your grazing animals are going to eat them on their own. So those are typically grasses. Uh, we just um, had an excavator come through. And so we threw down a bunch of um, uh, alfalfa and uh, clover for our animals to, for to uh, forage on. So those aren't something that are te technically a fodder crop because a fodder crops are things you plant that grow, you harvest them, you might cook them, may or, maybe, may, or may not cook them, um, and you're going to provide them instead of the animals naturally going through and grazing them. Uh, can a fodder crop turn into a forage? Absolutely. So if you're if you're like me and at the end of the gardening season, you say, all right, and you open the garden up to the chickens, technically those fodder crops just became forage crops because you didn't have to harvest them and prepare them or cut them up or anything like that. The chickens just go and, well, if they're like mine, they eat two bites of it and then they move on to the next thing, right? Um, so Forage crops and fodder crops can be used interchangeably, but just be kind of be kind of careful. It's it can be really easy to find information about forage crops where they talk a lot about different grasses to grow and things like that. It's a little harder to find stuff about fodder crops. So just something to kind of keep in mind. 
All right, next question. Why should you care about fodder crops? What's the big deal? So one, fodder crops reduce financial burden. So they save you money. Uh, just another way to say that. Fodder crops are more natural. So they're a more natural way to feed your animals. Fodder crops are satisfying to plant or harvest or all of the above. And three, two, one, here we go. Excellent, you got it. Um, and we're gonna be off VBOX for a little while because I'm about to roll into a next thing, but yes, absolutely. Um, so fodder crops 100% will reduce your financial burden. So um, as uh, I think G um, uh, Julie had posted a while back and, and promoting this, one of the reasons that I was really very interested in fodder crops was um, I've seen a trend at my local supply store where bales of hay were maybe, I do square bales of hay for the goats. They'll do, they'll be maybe $7 for a, a square bale when I first started. Um, I went back three months later to get another supply. Now they're $7.50, $7.75, and they're smaller. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? So the, there's there's some changes that have been happening, not only with our feed stores, um, but that have just around the world um, with a variety of things that are causing things to be more expensive, but you get less of it. Uh, and so I was like, I don't really like the idea of that. That really kind of bothers me. Secondly, um, one of the other things I didn't really like, especially about my chicken feed that I get, is that it, it's just like these pellets. It seemed really processed. Um, one of the reasons that we homestead is for, and our family is for cleaner food and healthier food. And I know where my food comes from. We raise meat birds and we have a garden and, and all that. And I know how those birds were treated. I know what they were fed. Like I know what's going into my body and that's a big deal. Um, but if I'm feeding them what looks like, uh, I don't know, uh, sawdust or uh, something that's really compacted or really processed, it just kind of started bothering me a lot. So Feeding them something that you're planting, your own vegetables from your own garden, um, it really, really, to me, makes me feel better about the health of my animals and, you know, all that, that sort of thing. Uh, fodder crops are satisfying to plant or harvest. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to talk uh, in depth about those fodder crops here in a moment. Um, but when you're pulling out a plant, uh, you know, some kind of a, a vegetable or fruit that's like 20 pounds and it's one plant, like, come on, that is super satisfying. Um, I love, I love harvesting potatoes because you just dig your hands in there and it's like an Easter egg hunt. You just pounds and pounds of potatoes from one half pound potato. I mean, that's amazing. So they're, they're incredibly satisfying to be able to harvest. Uh, to me, they're satisfying to plant because in some cases I can just direct sow these guys and I don't have to worry about, oh, I need to put them here and then I need to transplant them. And then I, I got to have a no fuss garden, or as I said, it's going to die. So good job, everybody, for answering that one correctly. Okay. So now that all the, here's why why you, what fodder crops are, why you should care about them, all kind of stuff out of the way. Let's actually talk about five fodder crops. We're going to kind of use the Letterman top five fodder crops in my eyes, um, and I'm going to count down. So, so starting with fodder crop number five is corn. So corn's in a lot of the, the processed foods that we eat that are pets, you know, dogs and cats. There's a lot of corn in that, uh, things like that. So it's not necessarily the healthiest thing, that's why it comes in at five, but let's talk a little bit about corn. Um, so days to harvest, you're, you're looking at 70 days or so, so about two months, but it just depends on the variety. Could be shorter, could be longer, just depends on that. Um, zones three through nine. So that pretty much covers the entire uh, continental United States. Um, they need typically a square foot, just depends on the variety though. You could have some that don't need as much space, that need more space. You just check your packet to be able to find that out. Typically, uh, depending again, depending on the variety, you can get three ears of corn per stalk. So that's per kernel uh, that you plant. A couple of things on, on nutritional notes. Um, it's a good source of vitamin A, fiber, and carbohydrate. So it's a good energy source. Um, but that, that's about it. So it's, you know, people have a 
in my opinion, kind of a misconception about the health factor of corn. It's a starch. Uh, so for humans eating a ton of it is not, we, our bodies don't process it, right? And it's just not the best thing for us to eat. Same kind of thing for the animals, but it is cost effective. It does give them energy that they need, especially in the winter. Um, so, and some other advantages here, you can easily freeze it uh, for long-term storage. I know next month we're talking about freeze drying. You could definitely freeze dry corn. Um, that's something that's easily done. It's a low cost thing to plant. Um, it's fast to harvest in, in comparison to other, other crops. Um, and my personal favorite, the goats will eat the whole thing. Uh, kernels, uh, the cob, the stalk, the leaves, they'll eat the whole thing. So it's something that's, that's kind of nice that, you know, if like me, if it doesn't grow and it just ends up being a stalk without any actual fruit on it, I'll just feed the stalk to the goats and it's still not a waste for me. Um, the, the kind of disadvantages other than to me, like the nutritional portion, um, for those of you that don't know, know corn pollinates by wind. Uh, so like bees could get in there, I guess, but it really is based on wind. So if you're not in a, an area that gets any wind, then you're going to be going out there and shaking corn all the time. Uh, so maybe not the most, uh, the easiest thing. Luckily where I am, we get a surprising amount of wind. Wasn't in expecting that when I moved here. Uh, so we don't typically have a problem with pollination with our corn, but just something to keep in mind. So it's an okay uh, crop. It's something that's really easy to start with. Uh, it's pretty satisfying because it does grow quickly. At least for me, it has. Um, so something that you can look at and people, you'll find that anywhere. It's readily available. So it's a cheaper seed to find. Crop number four, this I found while I was doing my research, and I can't tell you how excited I am uh, that I found this. Um, so I'm going to butcher it. This is a Japanese word, but I'm going to say mampukuji carrots. These grow two to three feet long, y'all. These are huge carrots. So they're also really satisfying to harvest. I'm going to order some literally this week because you can you can plant them now um, when they... Uh, after the frost, they just get sweeter. They're one of those plants that does that. So uh, now is a really good time to actually plant these. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So days to harvest, as long as you can wait. The longer you wait, the bigger they're going to get. And so the larger the harvest you're going to get. But you can harvest them as, as quickly as you do like a Danvers or anything like that. And you'll get regular size carrots, which is kind of uh, kind of unique. Or you can wait and harvest these huge, huge carrots. They're good in any zone in the continental United States. So we're talking three through 10. Um, they need a little bit of space. The more space you give them, the bigger they're going to grow. Um, the caveat I'll give for these specific carrots is if you have hard packed soil, uh, like we have red clay here in Eastern Tennessee, they're not going to be great for putting right in that hard packed clay. They need a loose soil to be able to grow into. So for me, I'm about to clear out one of my raised beds. I'm going to try to plant them in raised beds and see how that goes uh, over the winter. So uh, I'm excited about that. You can grow a lot of these. They get real big. They get real heavy. So you, we're talking tons of food. Um, I'm going to do my, my beds are like a three by eight, four by eight. Um, I'm going to fill those with these and I'll post in Mighty Networks in the, in the winter uh, once I harvest them about what I'm getting out of that and maybe encourage you guys to do that as well. Um, like any carrot, they're good for beta carotene and vitamin A. Um, other advantages, animals can eat any part of the plant. Just be careful with, with ruminants on the tops. So if, you're, if you've got any kind of ruminant, the tops of the carrots, sometimes too much of a good thing, right? Is never a good thing. So just be careful of not feeding them too much of that. Um, and they can be stored, stored for like seven to nine months in the right conditions. So they should be a, an excellent thing for any kind of a root cellar uh, or, or things like that. Uh, I'm going to say, um, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at the Q&A. So feet or inches. Okay. Okay, Melody, you got answered yourself. So all is good. Yeah. So they need two to three inches of space, but they will grow two to three feet. Uh, they are huge. Um, and just in case I didn't mention it before, want to make sure you when you harvest them, you're going to want to dig them up because they're so long. Um, it, it's going to be real upsetting if you go to pull it up from the tops and it breaks in the soil because they're so long. So you're going to want to dig them up, use some kind of a trowel or something like that to be able to really get down into it and pull pull it up instead of just pulling it from the, the tops. Okay. 
Crop number three, mammoth sunflowers. So um, I grow these. Um, this is actually a picture of last year of one of my mammoth sunflowers with one of my little honeybees on there. Um, days to harvest, typically about 70 days. Uh, zones two through 10. Any of you guys can do this. They need about 18 inches. I've grown them tighter together, um, but they, based on the packet, they'd like 18 inches. Um, what I've read, now I've gotten more, but you can get a pound of seed from one sunflower plant. Um, that's what they what they say on the on the package and what you'll see in research is when you grow a mammoth sunflower, you're gonna have one head on it. However, if you see in the picture right here, there's two heads on there. Uh, one's likely going to be smaller, but that's still going to have viable seed in there. Um, so I've I have one growing outside right now that probably has 30 heads on it that are all going to be full of viable seed. So I'm saying a pound of seed per plant at minimum. I'm going to put that in there. So nutritional notes, excellent source of vitamins uh, B6, thiamine, magnesium, copper, phosphorus, manganese, vitamin E, and selenium. When I was doing my research, I got real excited about that last one. Uh, we are in a very selenium deficient area. Um, goats need selenium. They need it. Uh, now I'll note those of you that have sheep, these have copper in them. You need to be real careful about that. From my understanding, and I don't have sheep. So feel free in the chat if you have sheep, Correct me if I'm wrong, keep me honest here, but they should not have that copper or that's really dangerous for sheep. Um, but for goats, the copper is fine. And the selenium, they need that selenium. So this is an excellent source of natural selenium for them. Um, and then other advantages is an excellent source of pollen. So you see my bee hanging out on there. I see bees, all kinds of bees, um, all kinds of variety of animals uh, and pollinators on my mammoth sunflowers all the time. Uh, they're an excellent source of pollen. They are also make a really sturdy trellis for companion planting. So this year I've got my um, mammoth sunflowers right next to my peas and my green beans. And so the peas and the green beans just climb up it. I don't have to sit here and buy a bunch of cattle panel or, or buy a bunch of um, tomato cages or anything like that. I just grow them side by side. They complement each other well. And then I have a natural way of trellising. You can also, depending, um, and there's a lot of variety of giant mammoth sunflowers, okay? But mammoth is typically the common one that you'll find in variety. Um, but you can also, when you harvest the head, you can harvest the stem, let it dry out, and then you've got another, you can use that trellis again and again, okay? Just similar to like you would use a bamboo trellis as well. Um, and lastly, maybe my favorite piece, you can direct sow sunflowers. I had a lot of uh, volunteer sunflowers pop up this year from birds, you know, carrying them last year. They survived the winter and all of a sudden I have this, you know, 15 foot sunflower that sprouted in the middle of where my uh, chickens hang out. So they get sunflowers just kind of naturally. Those seeds will fall and the heads will fall and it's nice and easy. So I love that they're direct. So because again, if there's a lot of work involved with this, like I'm going to struggle with it. So uh, direct sow is really nice. I can just stick them right in the ground outside when it's time. And then shortly, I'll start to see um, see them sprout and pop up. So mammoth sunflowers are awesome. All right. Number two, the tromboncino squash. So um, I get picked on a lot for work of having a lot in my background. Uh, I've just This is my office. This is my music room. This is my sunroom. This is my everything. But apparently now it's my tromboncino squash room. So I have a tromboncino squash drying on my piano. Um, it's about three and a half feet long. Um, this one I harvested. Maybe I could have let it go, but it was the way I have it trellis was on a cattle panel and it was on the ground already. So I was like, I'm going to go ahead and pull it. Um, but yeah, it's three and a half feet long and seven or eight pounds of food right there that I'm just letting dry out and I'll feed those to the goats. So days to harvest, 60 to 90 days. This depends on when you harvest them. And that's another advantage of this particular squash. Um, zones three through eight, you want to give them plenty of space. The more space you give them, uh, similar to a pumpkin um, or a watermelon, the, the bigger they're going to get. They need some space to be able to move around and grow. Um, 
fodder output up to 15 pounds. You could probably see them do more for you, uh, but caveat, make sure you have a sturdy trellis if you're gonna trellis them. You don't have to trellis though. You can let them grow on the ground. If you let them grow on the ground, they will curl like in that um, the picture that you've got there. If you trellis them, they will trellis straight up and down like this. So there's there's no harm in, in letting them grow on the ground if you're like, I'm not gonna go out and buy a cattle panel. I guarantee you that growing them, unless you harvest them early, that growing them on a um, like a tomato cage, they're going to break that cage. They're very heavy, very sturdy. Okay. Nutritional notes: <clears throat> they're an excellent source of potassium, calcium, iron, zinc, omega three, vitamin A, and vitamin C. Um, the other advantage that you'll find: you can harvest them early for a sweeter squash. Okay, so if you like more of a summer squash, you can harvest them when they're, you know, eight or 12 inches long. You don't have to wait. Um, and then you get to harvest them a little bit earlier, too. Uh, you can still feed those to your animals, perfectly healthy to do so. They also store well as a winter squash. So I let mine keep going and keep going as long as I felt like it was appropriate. Plus, I wanted I harvested it about two days ago. I wanted you guys to see one. So I figured I'd, I'd harvest it so you could see it. Um, but they do store well as a winter squash and they can be cooked similar to a butternut. Uh, so you can do soups with it or, or things like that. Uh, my plan for this one, um, those of you in my team, you know, my husband is a very picky eater. So my plan is not to probably cook this because he won't eat it. It is instead to feed it to our goats and to our chickens. So I'm going to help to reduce our costs on our feed with that. Um, I did, because this one's kind of a weird, um, like kind of out of the, it's a little different. Um, I did go ahead and bring my seed packet so that you can see what the what the seed packet for what I grew looks like. These are, and that might be hard to see. These are from superseeds.com. And I'm not, you know, I'm not sponsored by them or anything. Um, but these are these are great. The seeds are similar in size to me as like a pumpkin seed. So they're they're not like crazy huge or anything. But the other really big advantage about this as opposed to maybe the carrots um or I, I guess the corn, I don't have a lot of experience with like uh, storing seeds from corn, um, but these are really easy to be able to pick out of your fruit because they're so big um, and you could just seed save these, grow them again. So they're a nice kind of way to um, reduce your cost on buying the seeds. The seeds aren't expensive um, by any means, but this way you don't have to worry about um, the quality of them. You know, if you harvested something nice and big like this, you're going to reap those rewards year after year. Let's see, um, how are they with squash bugs? So I have had squash bugs. I did last year cucumber. I decided this year to take a break from it because, well, um, I got a lot of cucumber last year. And as I said, my husband's very picky. He does not like cucumber or pickles or any of that. Uh, pretty much anything green, y'all, it's it's a struggle. So, um, so yeah, so I had squash bug problems last year with cucumbers that I grew um, and with, I grew a bunch of fruits last year too, watermelon and cantaloupe and things like that. I have not had a single squash bug problem with that. Um, that's also potentially because I'm doing other measures in my garden to help prevent that though. So, you know, don't hold me to it. I'm not saying they're squash bug, bug free, but I have not seen a single squash bug on my plants this year. But thank you for the question. Excellent question. All right. Okay, and crop number one, get excited. The mangle wurzel beet. I have some growing in the garden right now. They won't be ready to the fall. And so I didn't wanna pick this a smaller beet for you guys and you'd be like, oh, is that it? Um, so when I harvest it, I'll post it in Mighty so you guys can see the size of these beets. I will actually probably do another crop of them here shortly. I might try them in another raised bed of mine just because my back's starting to hurt. I don't feel like bending over to try to like deal with all of this. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I might try them in another raised bed. Um, but these have a longer date harvest um, and that's because they grow huge. They are a huge beet. Um, they are in the sugar beet family and um, Swiss chard. So just to, as kind of an FYI, if you're thinking, well, you know, I don't know about this. What does it taste like? You're looking at that kind of a, a flavor if you decide to cook these. Uh, zones two through 10, so perfectly appropriate for anybody in the U.S. Um, space, 
look, the more space you give it, the bigger it's going to get. So if you stack them a foot apart, they will either, depending on your, uh, your soil, they'll either grow down if you've got nice loose soil or they'll grow out. Now, if, if you're like us, East Tennessee, you've got a lot of hard clay, they're going to probably grow out. And if you've got them butt up against each other, you're going to restrict the size of your fruit, okay? So just something to keep in mind. If you till it up really good, if you broad fork really good, and you do have some loose soil for a, a foot or two, you're probably fine to pack them in a little tighter. So it's, it's up to you. You can kind of experiment with it too. Um, the fodder output on this is amazing. 20 pounds or larger per root. So as I said, make sure you give it space. Um, nutritional notes, high in sugar, calcium, magnesium. These things are amazing. They store well, um, like over winter. They stay fresh in the root cellar for months. You don't have to do all this prep. You can just leave them in dirt and just, you know, sit them in your root cellar and you're good to go. Um, not a problem. Every part is edible. So, and completely safe. So um, for me, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but mine have these beautiful pink stems, almost like a um, like a rhubarb or something. They have pink stems with green leaves on them. Perfectly fine. And different varieties will have different colors of foliage and you'll find yellow or green or blue or purple. They, it's really kind of neat. Um, easy to store the seeds for the next season. So the seeds, I've got seeds here. They're not super huge. They're maybe, I don't know what the size of them would be in comparison to anything else, but um, they're also kind of bumpy. They're a really unique looking seed. I've never seen a seed like this before, um, but they're they're easy to store because they are much larger than uh, some of the seeds that you'll find. Um, and they're great for lactating animals because you've got, got that high calcium and magnesium. So again, because this is one of my favorites, if not my favorite, um, here is my seed packet of where I got mine from. You can see if that will show up. Um, the picture of the little girl carrying one has just carried both hands. It's so large. Uh, these do get quite big. You'll also hear them called mangold beets or fodder beets, quite literally fodder beets. Um, these are, this particular pack is from Baker Creek, but you can find them in all kinds of different locations. Um, so those are, uh, those are huge. Those make a big difference and uh, do really well for your, for your animals. So, but just give them plenty of space. Okay. So those are our top five. So let's see what you remember. Let's go back over to VVox and we're going to do um, some basically lightning round type uh, question and answer. Before we go in, um, let's look at questions. So do you feed it raw to the animal? Any of the things that I listed here, you are welcome to feed raw to your animal. So the sunflower seeds are fine. Um, uh, corn definitely is okay. Uh, the squash, any of that stuff should be fine to feed your animals. But I would always recommend, I know my animals, so I would always recommend that you double check for yours. If you had different breeds or um, species than I do, make sure that you check that um, before you do so. I don't want anybody getting sick or anything like that. So just double check it. All right, how do you get beet seeds? So these will have seeds in them. They're a little bit different. Um, so they're, you're not gonna see flowers on the top. That's what I also like about a lot of these that I've talked about today. You're not gonna see, um, you're not gonna harvest seeds from a flower bloom. That, I, I never quite know when to harvest seeds from a flower bloom. I need to learn more about that. Um, but I can harvest seeds from the inside of a squash all day long because it's it's just right there. And I don't have to worry about that. Um, so they should be inside the beets when you open them up. Uh, can the carrots and beets be fed to the animals after they've gone to seed? Yeah, you're not going to have any, you shouldn't have any issues with that um, as long as the fruit is still healthy. So it's not molded or I'll put it this way. If you would eat it, this is my philosophy for all of our animals. If you would eat it, it's okay for them to eat it, okay? Even if it's not the most tasty thing for you, it can still provide nutrition for your animals as well. So it shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem with that. All right, uh, will you be going over how much feed per animal, like how many beets per dozen chickens per month? Uh, it all it all kind of depends, okay? So um, that's why I tried to give you the fodder output for each of these um, on the slide deck. Um, I'm producing per beet seed, I'll produce 20 pounds. Um, my chickens will go through a 50 pound bag. I have eight 
they'll go through a 50 pound bag of feed about once a month. Um, so that might save me a week or two of feeding them that, or they'll fill up on that. So they're not eating as much of that feed. So it just depends. I feel like every flock I've seen or every um, herd I've seen is just a little bit different with their eating habits. So, um, you know, you can kind of, to me, take that fodder output and equate it to, okay, if I'm, if I'm having to buy a 50 pound bag of feed once a month, and this is going to give me 20 pounds of food, then I only need really 30 pounds as long as I'm continuing to provide this for my animals. Hopefully that helps. Uh, do any of these have an excessive amount, amount of calcium? So I would say probably these mangle wurzel beets are going to be high in calcium uh, for you. So that's kind of nice for chickens, right? They need that calcium for their shells. Um, I also, this is not technically a fodder crop, but I feed my uh, chicken shells back to them. I will cook them and stuff like that for calcium. So I'm not sure, Jessica, if your question was about to help with, with chicken calcium level. Um, I'm tired of buying oyster shell. I don't buy oyster shell anymore. Um, but yeah, this, this last one, this beet has a high amount of calcium there for you that should help with um, any kind of calcium deficiencies you might have in your animals. Okay, perfect. Let me see if I've got any other questions out here. Nope, looks good. Oh, okay. Um, do you have to cut each type of fodder into pieces for them? It depends on your animal. Um, so with the uh, with corn, when I feed my goats the corn, I will typically cut them into smaller chunks because I'm nervous that they're gonna try to swallow the whole cob. I'm neurotic, so that's like not a real thing. Like they aren't really gonna do that, but I'm so nervous that they're gonna swallow it and choke on it. And anyway, I freak out about that stuff. Um, for this, I probably will cut this tromboncino squash into smaller pieces for the goats so that one person doesn't hog the whole thing because they're a bunch of bullies. Um, so I probably will cut them up, but you could certainly just throw that in there and they'll, they'll eat it. Uh, with chickens, I found that they tend to like the fleshier part of a fruit or a, a vegetable. Um, and so I will cut this up for chickens as well. Uh, because of the heat that we've had lately, I will probably even cut some of this up, freeze it, and then give them the frozen pieces so they just have a cool treat to be able to enjoy as well. So it's up to you and it depends on your livestock, whether or not you wanna cut that fodder up into pieces. Uh, for male goats, I don't currently have male goats. So I can't, I, I don't feel comfortable really necessarily speaking to that. Um, but yeah, I just, I feel like it all, all kind of depends on, uh, on your guy. I've heard females are a lot pickier than males. So I don't think you're gonna have problems, but I think you'll know better about what types of vitamins they need, what they're deficient in, and that'll help you kind of decide what kind of crop you're interested in, in growing. All right, and I did talk about cutting them up for chickens. I will likely, just because I know my chickens and I baby my chickens real bad, I will likely cut up um, uh, the sunflowers I don't, the corn I don't, I'll just throw those in. I'll take the husk off of corn, but I, I'll just throw those in, I don't care. Uh, but for the beets um, and for, and the carrots, I'll throw those in too, but for the beets and for the squash, I'll probably cut those up. And then that way they get into the fleshy stuff quicker and they don't lose interest. They tend to be a little ADHD, at least mine do. So they'd probably take that after me. Um, do you free, free, free feed or do you have to ration? So um, for me, we don't free feed on, on the fodder crops. I like to ration that out. Um, we will give them... And plus two, I, I don't necessarily want to have them spike in a certain thing, right? So it's nice to get them things in moderation as we go through it. So um, so yeah, I, I will typically not let them free feed. However, if I had extra food in the garden and it's time to overwinter that garden, I don't mind throwing the chickens in there and letting them go to, go to town and I won't ration that out. But for the goats, um, especially because they're we're about to go in our kidding season, I'm going to be a lot more, I pay a lot more attention to what they're eating to make sure that they're providing, I'm providing the right nutri nutrition to them and they're not overeating on something that I don't want them to. Because again, I'm controlling and neurotic. So that's how that works. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. If you still have questions, feel free to drop them in, but let's get to this kind of speed round of our last series of questions on VBOX. Again, if you're not on there and you want to jump in, uh, you can scan that QR code. You can go to vbox.app and then enter that ID and your name and you'll be in there. So I've got 
five questions about what we just talked about and then one kind of extra freebie at the end. So here we go. <clears throat> Which fodder crop can produce 20 pounds of food per plant? Is that the Mambukuji carrot, the uh, corn, the Trumboncino squash, which I got that guy right here, uh, or the mangle wurzel beet? Or the mangle beet or the fodder beet? All right. And we're running, I know we're running a little over on time. So three, two, and one. Let's see what you got. Excellent. Yes, that is the mangle wurzel. The Trumboncino will do up to 15 pounds. So it's a really good contender, especially for those of you that enjoy growing squash. This is really satisfying to grow because you could watch it happen. I actually ended up, because I neglect my garden, I was coming down from doing a hive inspection and locked in my garden. I was like, oh, look, I've got like a three foot long squash in the garden. Didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't even know it was happening. Uh, but yes, the mangle wurzel beet is the, the contender there. All right, next one. Which fodder crop is also a great pollinator, meaning that it provides excellent pollen for bees. It'll attract bees into your garden, things like that. So is that going to be corn, the mammoth sunflower, the mangle wurzel beet, or the mambukuji carrot? All right. And that is going to be everybody because I'm also in here. I see 20 out of 21. I'm in there. I'm just not answering questions. Let's see how you did. Excellent. Yes, that one was a little bit of a gimme, but yeah, the man, the the mammoth sunflower is going to give you excellent pollen for your pollinators to come into the garden. It's also really beautiful to look at. Um, I, I don't need to tell you guys. I'm sure that you've seen a sunflower, um, but they are really gorgeous, and you will see a lot more pollinators coming because the 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 color of them is attractive to bees, and the size, the amount of pollen they produce is excellent. All right, question number three. Uh, which fodder crop is an excellent source of selenium? Let's see if you remember this one. Is it the mammoth sunflower, the mangle wurzel beet, corn, or the tromboncino squash? All right, and three two, one, perfect. Let's see, who at 50-50, but yes, it is the sunflower. Surprisingly enough, that sunflower is gonna provide excellent selenium. Um, for me, it's an excellent thing for goats because it got it has the copper and it has the selenium in it, love it. And of course the chickens love the sunflowers too. All birds love the sunflowers. All right. Uh, which fodder crop is good for lactating animals? It's got that high calcium and magnesium, if I remember those two right. So is that the tromboncino squash, the mambukuji carrot, uh, the mangle wurzel beet, or the mammoth sunflower? I think I'm getting the hang of saying mambukuji. I don't know if that's how you say it, but I think I'm getting the hang of it. I think it sounds good. Sounds about right. All right, three, two, one. Yes, that is correct. The mangle wurzel beet or the mangle beet of the fodder beet. Uh, excellent for lactating animals, animals getting ready to lactate because it has those good vitamins for those animals. All right, and I think this is our last quiz type question. Which fodder crop needs a sturdy trellis? If you don't, plant it and have it go across the ground. So maybe a little extra hint. The Trombocino squash, the Mambukuji carrot. I think I just put that in a bunch because I like saying that word now. Uh, corn or a mammoth sunflower. Which was which one's gonna need a sturdy trellis? All right, everybody's answered. So that one must've been an easy one. Yes, excellent. There's this guy right here, this Trombocino squash. Uh, it's gonna need a sturdy trellis unless you plant it on the and let it just go across the ground. It will take over whatever space, similar to a pumpkin patch, okay? So if you plant it on the ground, be ready for it to just go crazy. All right, and then the last question is really more of a poll because I'm just interested to see what you guys think. If you're not interested at all, you can just, I think, skip the question. You don't have to answer it or touch anything, but I am interested to know if any of these sound interesting for you to plant in your next growing season or as in the case of the beet and the carrot, maybe starting them this fall. And you can pick as many as you'd like and just make sure you hit 
Um, there's a, what is the name of the button? A send button, but pick as many as you want. Just hit send when you're ready. All right, three, two, one. Let's see, let's see what you guys are interested in. Oh, interesting. Very nice. I was surprised myself um, that the mammoth sunflower had as many really good um, vitamins and minerals for my animals. Um, so maybe that's why you guys chose that one. But um, the mango will beet, you can't beat it for the, uh, the seed. The cost to output ratio is quite excellent. So I'm looking forward to that. So my last slide is a thank you. I'm going to show the leaderboard on your screens here. Uh, looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six tied for first place. I'm gonna send, uh, Julie, I'll send you a screenshot in Slack, at least I hope to, of those names so we can add them to the spinner for our giveaway. Oh, maybe it's not gonna work because I'm sharing my screen. Let me stop sharing, try it again, perfect. Very good. So congratulations to Aurelia, which I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, and Cheryl, Diana, June, Linda, and Natasha. You guys did excellent. You all tied for first. So what we'll do, Julie, um, I just sent you the names in Slack, and uh, let's do two winners. We'll just spin the wheel, and you guys can choose um one or two packets of seeds of any of those fodder crops we talked about today and i will get them to you we'll communicate through slack but in the meantime does if you have any other questions feel free to drop in the q a or um, on vbox if you want to drop them in the q a there uh in the chat anywhere like that let's see i got one um do you plant the beets in a raised bed as i have clay soil as well yeah um so right now mine are in the ground um so i'm fully expecting they've got plenty of space i'm expecting them to grow more wide than long they're going to grow more horizontal than vertical um, and that's going to be okay i i'm one of those like i don't care how pretty something is like as long as it's still doing its function we're good um I am going to toss some seeds in one of my raised beds. My um, raised, bread, raised beds are about three and a half by eight. Really, they're, they're almost four by eight. So I should be able to plant maybe six or seven, maybe more. I don't know. I haven't quite decided yet. In a raised bed, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm using the... Um, uh, Mel's mix in my raised bed so I could do some square foot gardening so that should have plenty of room for them to be able to grow in there uh, so yeah I'm going to give it a shot in raised beds I encourage you to try it too um, are they helping to break the clay not really <laughs> not for me at least uh, but basically if they're they're meeting that resistance um, they're just they're going they're like okay forget it and they just go somewhere else they're going to go wider um, again it's not a problem um, but they'll they're once they hit that spot where you've stopped tilling or or breaking up your own clay when you planted uh, they're like okay I give up and they stop so no problem all right um, and then Oh, okay, interesting. I don't, I've never heard, I don't even know how to say that word, honestly, Aurelia, but um, that sounds really, really neat. I'll have to look into that because I'm interested in um, raised beds too. Unless that's the thing where you put like um, uh, stumps or logs in the bottom and then those deteriorate and do all that kind of stuff. Because I'm doing that too, because my beds are too tall because I have bad back and I don't like leaning over stuff. And so it'll, it'll break down. If that's that same thing, I am doing that. I just didn't know it was, that was called, but I want to learn more about that. So I'm going to look that up myself. That is a big thing right now in Oklahoma. Hugoculture is like a big wave, so to speak here. So I, that doesn't surprise me. That, not that I don't know for real. I think really, I don't know where she is, but that's a big thing here in Oklahoma right now. So, okay, awesome. I have our wheel. Um, we have, uh, I love you, June, but you know the rules. If you're on the executive staff, you don't get to play. So I'm going to give you a shout out for being first, but you don't get to play. And it's not because I don't love you. So <laughs> here we go. All right, are we ready? Here we go. Spin, will spin. All 
All right, Diana. All right, Diana. I'll get up with you on Mighty Networks. And then you gonna do one more? Let's do it. Yep. All right. There we go, Linda. And Linda, I'll text you because Linda's in my chapter. You go, girl. Yay, Linda. I'll get well, you your seats. Fun. Awesome. Yeah. Robin, you did such a great job. This, it's, it's funny because my husband got home. That was the ear porn that entered my <laughs> as soon as we started. But I didn't, he was like, what are you just going to talk about wheat and alfalfa all day? Because that's what he thinks when he, and I was like, interesting you would say that because that's not at all what we're talking about so I'm so thankful that you shared that because it was awesome you did such a great job and I think you made all of us think there's so much more than what we realize in the world of fodder so you did such a great job and I, I really appreciate you coming on so thank you ladies um remember next month we meet this first wednesday of every month um i'd love to have you guys back we're talking with esther arkfeld and we are doing uh the introduction basics of how to use freeze drying so i know nothing about that and i know it's a like expensive adventure to jump into but i also think it's super fun so come join us next month. We will be here the first Wednesday. I know that Christine will probably drop in the chat. There's like chat is blowing up. Um, but make sure you check us out next month. I really, really appreciate all you guys joining, coming. I thank Robin. I thank June. And Christine's behind the scenes. And I didn't even tell her thank you. Christine is my magic lady behind the scenes. I really appreciate it. Uh, I wouldn't be able to drop links and talk at the same time because my brain doesn't work that way. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate you coming tonight. You all are awesome.